You know what the problem is, Brian? The pro- if, if they would bring AJ Styles out there and let him cut promos saying he believed the earth was flat, I would like the whole gimmick better because at least they'd be making him a heel. That's the problem. I figured this out. Well, I've talked about it for weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months and years and years and years. But so it's not like something I just figured out. But this was the most glaring week on television ever, I think, for the, the rule of wrestling 101, wrestling booking, that I explained to the guys that came to OVW that had never been in a wrestling ring in front of people a day in their life. The most important thing about wrestling is that the fans have to know who's on whose side, who's mad at each other, and why they're fighting. And then everything else can be worked out. But if the fans don't know that, the answer to those basic three simple questions, who's on whose side, who's fighting, and why, then you got caca. And there's not just no heels and no baby faces in the ring. There's no heels and no baby faces in the booking. There's no structure to, to save the, the talent from themselves not knowing what to do because they're just going in and doing moves because that's the structure of the companies. That's what they, they have completely lost the plot on this whole thing. Everybody, <clears throat> because if you're just having guys in tights going out and doing moves to each other without having a clear cut, not only reason to fight, but also a clear cut choice for the fans to make and make it consistent if the top babyface Brian and other top babyface Jim are fucking friends for three weeks and then suddenly they're wrestling each other on the fourth week and punching each other in the face, but then on the fifth week they're ambivalent. It, it you're, you're splitting the audience. There's always going to be heel fans. There were heel fans who hated the Rock and Roll Express because their girlfriends liked them, loved them. And so they were naturally, well, oh, I hope the horsemen beat the shit out of them or Flair because he was cool. But when you have a lot of heel fans, it fucks up the, the matches, actually, in the way you can have them. But still, the fans of the heels were fans of the heels because they were heels. And they had a specific reason for disliking the baby faces or liking the heels. And the fans of the baby faces, obviously the same. They had a specific reason for liking the heels and not liking the baby, the or for liking the baby faces and not liking the heels. So everybody was on the same page. But the performances determined the fans' reactions. And it wasn't that hard to book. <clears throat> and it wasn't that hard to fucking perform once everybody was per- performing the same flavor of play are we going to do a fucking musical or a drama or a comedy or whatever but everybody's a consistent character and good versus evil is not a hard emotion to understand or to book i wonder if a dutch told me about it when fucking shit stain in orlando at a tna taping was telling dutch i just don't understand this whole heel and baby face thing and dutch said well they wrote a whole book about it you ought to read it and vince said, what's that the Bible. Coming from Mr. Christian, he didn't get the whole baby face heel thing. <clears throat> it, it, it doesn't have to be so contrived as to have baby face and heel on the fucking shirts like the henchmen in the Batman series to identify, but you have to be a smart enough booker to bring personalities into your company into your territory or your roster or whatever that are clear and distinct that you can match up with each other to sell tickets and to engender interest and to get the talent over instead of just putting everybody out there to do moves because we've established what was their rating on saturday six o'clock at night unopposed seven hundred and seventy five thousand viewers same thing as on wednesday night practically when they're opposed or when they're not opposed on Wednesday, or when they're on Saturday, or whatever. You're not reaching anybody else, because to most people, this shit does not make sense anymore. 
<clears throat> and it starts with not only the the talent being able to perform these things, and I'm not talking about performing flips and tricks. I'm talking about performing emotions. But for the bookers and the promoters and the people in charge of this to be able to create that atmosphere. Brian Last, do you, do you know who a great booker was? Do you know who a great booker in three minutes booked one of the most memorable angles ever between baby faces and heels? Who's that? Charlie Daniels. Charlie Daniels. I thought about this when I was on my way in search of a post office the other day, and this came on the radio. <laughs> the Devil Went Down to Georgia is one of the great baby face and heel jobs of booking. All the way through, everything you would want to do, think about this, replay the song in your mind. From the very start, and in three minutes, they establish, they do everything that you should do to hype a fight. Establish the location and the opponents. Tell you what their motivations are. Give you the stipulation, and then you hear the challenge asked and answered, right? The devil went down to Georgia. He was looking for a soul to steal, and he was in a bind because he was way behind. He was willing to make a deal. When he came across this young man sawing on a fiddle and playing it hot, and the devil jumped up on a hickory stump and said, boy, let me tell you what. I bet you didn't know it, but I'm a fiddle player too. And if you care to take a dare, I'll make a bet with you. Now you play pretty good fiddle, boy, but give the devil his due. I bet a fiddle of gold against your soul because I think I'm better than you. The boy said, my name's Johnny, and it might be a sin, but I'll take your bet. You're going to regret because I'm the best there's ever been. Right there. Location, opponents, motivations, stipulation, challenge, asked and answered. Now you got the ballyhoo, right? You got to sell the tickets. You got to reinforce the match, the stipulations, paint the baby face as an underdog. Johnny, you rosin up your bow and play your fiddle hard because hell's broke loose in Georgia and the devil deals the cards. And if you win, you get this shiny fiddle made of gold. But if you lose, the devil gets your soul. Holy shit, Johnny's in trouble, right? <clears throat> and now, now comes the match. And the heel, of course, jump starts it and gets the fucking heat. The devil opened up his case, and he said, I'll start this show, and fire flew from his fingertips as he rosined up his bow. And he pulled the bow across the strings, and it made an evil hiss. And then a band of demons joined in, and it sounded something like this. And the devil uses all of his heel fiddle tactics from hell. And the devilish licks and gets heat all over Johnny. But when all the hope is lost, Johnny makes his comeback. Right? When the devil finished, Johnny said, well, you're pretty good, old son, but sit down in that chair right there and I'll show you how it's done. And he does the fire on the mountain, run, boys, run. The devil's in the house of the rising sun. Chicken in the bread pan, picking out dough. Granny, we dog bite, no child, no. And he goes through the whole goddamn every grand old Opry fiddle lick and finishes with a nod to the orange blossom special. And the devil taps out and the baby face gets the last word. Well, the devil bowed his head because he knew that he'd been beaten. He laid that golden fiddle on the ground at Johnny's feet. And Johnny said, devil, just come on back if you ever want to try it again. Because I done told you once, you son of a bitch. I'm the best there's ever been. Three minutes. Baby face, heel, stipulation, match, finish. It's not that fucking hard, is it? I guess you've gone to sleep. Well, I'm... Hadn't thought about it in terms of Charlie Daniels before. Is Bad Bad Leroy Brown a good guy or a bad guy in the Jim Croce classic? He's a heel. He's a heel, and he's and like all the fucking Jim Croce songs, he kind of switches baby face at the end. I guess so. <laughs> right? <laughs> like all the Jim Croce songs. And and well, cause and you don't mess around with Jim. Cause he he was bad until he met Slim. Anyway. I, I, so what I did was I, I started thinking it's not this hard to establish your heels and your baby faces and, and book in, in any booker in any territory, small, large 60s, 70s, 80s before whatever the fuck. I want to explain what the talent roster looked like. You had a piece of paper and on one side you had all your heels and on the other side, you had all your baby faces, two columns. Vince McMahon, one of his picadillos, was not only his talent rosters, when you, and he wanted you to make a new talent roster before every TV writing meeting. Of course, those were, you know, before every meeting on a new set of taping, so once a month, right? 
he demanded that the baby faces be on the left and the heels be on the right. Not only on the talent roster, but also in your booking book. And it, God damn it, if, you know, if you didn't put them down that way, you're mixing them up. He had you fucking erase it and do it again. And what you did was, you, but that's not just Vince in the 90s. That's WCW in the late 80s, early 90s. That's me and Smoky Mountain Wrestling. That's every booker in every territory. Um, You had a list of baby faces and a list of heels, and you matched from column A to column B. There was no interrelation among the same column unless it was either two preliminary guys nobody cared about to begin with and you're just making a match to keep people's attention or a rare main event angle amongst two of the top guys from the same side, usually on the heel side because baby face matches were harder to have. So they were even rarer and usually only at the top or a little Billy Robinson, Tony Charles attraction in the middle. <clears throat> um, and still, they managed to keep all these matchups fresh in weekly territories and bi-weekly territories and especially monthly territories. Um, obviously there were stipulations and rematches and you'd, maybe you'd start out with a tag match. And if two guys ran in next week, you'd have a six man. And then you'd break out of it again with another tag match with stipulations and the other two guys in some stipulation match of their own, whatever you would keep it fresh and you would cycle talent your top talent stayed longer because they were main event guys. They drew money for you. You got had plenty of mileage to get out of them. <clears throat> you rotated your underneath guys every few months because that way you had fresh matchups and you had uh, other different people on your card to change the faces. I don't know why even a billionaire with unlimited amounts of money wants to sign his job guys to fucking ongoing contracts where they have to be shoved down our fucking faces and throats every week. But nevertheless, what I did was because I have the complete records or nearly complete. I went back to mid South wrestling of 1984. I said, I've thought about eighties Crockett, but there was so much talent. there, so many different guys that it would get really confusing, especially because this is audio, but I went to the biggest show of the month for Mid-South Wrestling for each month, February through November. And just, uh, I wanted to look and see how hard it was to make matches and new matches that drew and still keep baby faces and heels on a different side. And, and it, it kind of worked out easily. There were usually 18 to 20 guys in a territory, nine or 10 on each side. Uh, the, Oklahoma City show on February 19th, 1984 at two o'clock in the afternoon at the Myriad, which is, I hope it's still there. It was the most beautiful state-of-the-art building in the whole Mid-South Territory, gorgeous arena. Did $70,800 at the gate. That's about 8,000 fans. And the there were some matches that were, guys were finishing up and other matches, guys were just starting to come in and a few little attractions. That's where they had switched Jim Neidhart on Butch Reed. Neidhart turned babyface. They had been partners and tag team champions. Butch Reed beat Jim Neidhart. JYD, Junkyard Dog, beat Crusher Darso, the Russian sympathizer. Uh, Magnum 2, Magnum 2, Magnum TA and Wrestling 2 beat the Midnight Express by disqualification. Terry Taylor beat Nikolai Volkov. They got a match from Dallas. Mike Von Erich uh, beat Buddy Roberts. Poor Buddy was chosen to come up and babysit young Mike. But since the Dallas TV was on in Oklahoma and they got talent from Dallas, that was a feature attraction. Those were top guys. Kamala was on the card from Dallas also and beat a young job guy named T Tony Torres. The match was just for Kamala to be seen. Wendy Richter and Princess Victoria were in and, and Wendy uh, beat Princess Victoria. So two girls from Moolah as an attraction. And two preliminaries, Masayo Ito beat John King and Lanny Poffo beat Jerry Gray. You had 20 guys, 10 baby faces, well, 20 talents, 10 baby faces and 10 heels. It drew 70 grand in a town that we ran every two weeks, right? And then, by the way, we went to Tulsa that night at 730 at the Assembly Center 
uh, with the same card, except they mixed up the three preliminaries and did another $42,000 at the gate and 5,000 tickets. So we sold about just short of 13,000 tickets in the same day and did $113,000 in towns 75 miles apart. Uh, the next month, in March, the biggest show of the month. Am I boring you yet, Brian? Not at all. Okay. March 9th, the biggest show of the month was in Houston at the Sam Houston Coliseum. It was only $54,000. That was a little over 6,000 people. Same thing again, 20 guys on the card. Magnum T, uh, Magnum T, I keep doing it. Magnum TA and Wrestling 2 beat the Midnight Express. Uh, JYD lost to Masayo Ito on disqualification when he went nuts. Uh, Terry Taylor beat Butch Reed on DQ. The Rock and Roll Express had come into the territory by that time. They beat the Russians, Nikolai Volkov and Crusher Darso. Paul Bosch brought in a special match to appeal to the Houston fans. Hector Guerrero and El Bracero beat Gordman and Goliath. Buddy Landell had started by that time. He beat Lanny Poffo. And George Weingaroff beat Tom Lentz. Ten baby faces, ten heels drew 6,000 people in a town we ran every two weeks. Uh, the big event in April 7th, and you'll see a pattern here in a second. <clears throat> On April 7th, it was the Superdome in New Orleans. $176,000 house, 23,000 people. 22 talents on the card, and the Midnight Express worked twice. Uh, Bill Watson, Stagger Lee, who was JYD under the mask, beat the Midnight Express in the last stampede match. Hacksaw Duggan, who'd returned to the territory after doing a little loser leave thing, I believe, uh, came back and beat uh, Crusher Darso in a coal miner's glove match. Wrestling 2 beat Magnum TA in the student versus teacher match. The Midnight Express defended the Mid-South Tag Team title over Pork Chop Cash and Bill Dundee, it was supposed to be the Dream Machine. Pork Chop and the Dream were the Bruise Brothers, but Dream had broken his ankle, and they lost their spot. We've talked about that. Terry Taylor beat Butch Reed by disqualification. Kerry Von Erich appeared to beat Masayo Ito. The Rock and Roll Express beat Nikolai Volkov and the Russian Invader. Buddy Landell beat Lanny Poffo and Tom Zink. Spent his week in the Mid-South Territory by Vance. <laughs> <laughs> he beat Jerry Gray. 22 talents and the Midnight Express worked twice. Baby faces and heels. Everything was an angle. People knew why the match was taking place. And out of those 22 talents, only 10 had been on all three shows. Butch Reed, JYD, Darso, Volkoff, Terry Taylor, the Midnight Express, Ito, 2, and TA. Because there had already been a little bit of a turnover and there were some fresh faces coming in. The big show in May. May the 5th, 1984, was Little Rock, Arkansas, $71,000. It was sold out, 9,200 fans. That was the last stampede, but I do not have the complete results of that show. So we will go with May 11th back in Houston, a $60,000 house, which was 7,000 people or so, at with tickets at 15, 12, 8, and 5. So that's what, when we talk about these ticket averages, little business tip here. $15 was your first couple of rows of ringside. $12 was the rest of ringside. And sometimes the early reserved. Eight, either that or eight would be the reserved up in the bleachers and five would be general admission or eight would be general admission, five would be kids. The point is, since there were thousands more of the eight and fives than there were the 15 and 12s, you get about a, hopefully if you're doing good, a $9 ticket average. <clears throat> anyway, Hacksaw Duggan beat Nikolai Volkov. JYD beat Wrestling 2. The Rock and Roll Express beat The Midnight in a tag team title match. No, it was non-title. I tell a lie. Uh, Terry Taylor beat Butch Reed by disqualification again. They were protecting Butch. Hercules Hernandez had come in as Mr. Wrestling Number 3, Wrestling 2's evil henchman, and he beat Magnum T.A. Darso and Ito beat Hector Guerrero and Jose Lothario who was in as a special attraction for Houston. Dr. Death Steve Williams, who had come back and was a baby face again, but preparing to switch heel later in the summer, beat Buddy Landell. The Destroyer, Dick Beyer, beat Mark Reagan. That's what he had trained Mark Reagan and came down for a week or so around the horn to, uh, to put him over and 
we got to work with him, and that was a, a special deal for Houston because he had been big there. And Pat Rose beat John King. And on all four of these shows, now we were down to nine guys that had been on all four of them and some new talents coming in. So we go to June. And by the way, still no babyface and heel crossover. There's no reason for it. Because everybody knows why all these babyfaces and heels are mad at each other. June 16th, 1984, we go back to the Superdome in New Orleans, $166,000 house, somewhere around 20,000 people. JYD beat Butch Reed in a street fight. Magnum TA beat Ted DiBiase in a North American title match. The Midnight Express beat the Rock and Roll Express in a tag title match. Terry Taylor beat Crusher Darso, who was now going as Crusher Khrushchev, in a TV title match. They got a big match from Dallas. Chris Adams and Stella Mae French in the valet feud beat Jimmy Garvin and Precious. And of course, obviously, the men were not allowed to wrestle the women and vice versa, although the women took plenty of liberties with the men. Buddy Landell beat Sonny King. They had a women's tag match. Princess Victoria and Velvet McIntyre beat Wendy Richter and Peggy Lee. By the way, that was the night Wendy Richter was the my uh, planted cohort when i was handcuffed to hacksaw duggan and she brought the ether down to ringside uh and hercules hernandez the heel mr wrestling henchman beat wrestling two who had switched back baby face on his way to limping out of the territory 22 guys uh well 22 talents again on all five shows, now it's down to only seven people were on all five shows. The Rock and Roll Express were on four in a row. Butch Reed was on four out of five. Still no fucking crossover. Brian, do you see a pattern here? All these fucking guys had issues with these other guys that were kept up day in, day out, week in, week out on the television. That's why people came and bought tickets to see these fucking matches. They knew what was going on, and they knew why the guys were mad and what they were going for. You go to July the 6th. The big show that month is Houston, $71,000, about eight eighty five hundred 8,500 people. Midnight Express over the Rock and Roll Express. TA over DiBiase. Reed and Ernie Ladd beat Sonny King and Terry Taylor. Ernie Ladd, a special for the fucking Houston audience. Terry Taylor over Darso. Chavo and Hector Guerrero beat Hacksaw Duggan and Jose Lothario. Hercules beat Wrestling 2. The PYTs, the Pretty Young Things, Coco Ware and Norvell Austin, a new babyface team that have coming in because we're about to send the Rock and Roll Express out. They beat Pat Rose and Hans Schroeder, and Alberto Madrill beat Buddy Landell. Now there's only been six of our, and there's 23 talents on that card. Terry Taylor worked twice because somebody was hurt. Only six of the talents have been on all six of the shows. Rock and Roll was on five in a row. Reed was on five of six. So we go to August. The Superdome. $165,000 house. The tickets there were 50, 25, 20, 10, 8, and 5. Yes, you could get in the Superdome for $5. But sitting in the front row is going to cost you 50. <clears throat> so at that price, there was somewhere around sixteen to 18,000 people, we, we believe. I have an incomplete card here, but Flair went to a double disqualification with Kerry Von Erich for the NWA title. Magnum TA uh, wrestled Butch Reed for the North American title. The Midnight Express lost to Dusty Rhodes and Sonny King. It was supposed to be JYD, but he had left the territory. Hacksaw Duggan uh, had his blow off with Hercules Hernandez, Terry Taylor versus Dr. Death, the Fantastics coming in now against Darso and Landell, and they had like three or four preliminary matches. But now on all seven shows, only five of the talents have been on all seven shows. And there's like 24 guys at the Superdome. We're coming to an end here, and I'm going to wrap this up and explain my point. On September 9th, the big show was Houston. $62,000, 7,000-plus people. Hacksaw Duggan beat Hercules Hernandez in his blow-off there, and my hair was at stake, but since they had shaved my head the week earlier, my cousin Percy, amiably portrayed by Jim Jameson, came down from Memphis, and he got his head shaved that night. The Fantastics beat the Midnight Express by disqualification. 
Dr. Death beat Terry Taylor. Butch Reed beat Jose Lothario. Brickhouse Brown and Sonny King beat Ernie Ladd and Buddy Landell. Adrian Street beat Art Cruz. Rick McCord beat Johnny Mantell. Tony Torres beat Han Schroeder. Three people. The Midnight Express and Terry Taylor had been on every single one of those shows all year. Butch Reed had been on seven out of eight. Duggan had been on six out of eight. Everybody else was just a few times or new coming in. I will jump October because I didn't have the full card for the big show. And the last one, November 22nd of 84, back at the Superdome, was a disappointment. Only did a $104,000 gate and 12,000 or so people. But the Rock and Roll Express beat the Midnight Express in the scaffold match. Magnum TA beat Ernie Ladd for the North American title by disqualification. Hacksaw Duggan and Butch, Butch Reed beat Dr. Death and Ted DiBiase. Doc had switched heel, and now Doc and DiBiase had started their tag team that would dominate as the Midnight Express were leaving. They would be the new top heel team. Adrian Street and Miss Linda beat Bill Dundee in a handicap match. The Guerreros beat George Wells and Brickhouse Brown and several other matches. And then the following night in Houston, which was almost as good as the Superdome, we did a sellout 11000 plus and $89,800 for basically the same match, Rock and Roll Midnight, Doug and Butch, Doc and DiBiase, T.A. and Ladd, the Guerreros, but also Landell versus Taylor, Hercules beat Tony Falk, and Tim Horner jerked the curtain against Jack Victory. And on that weekend, the Thursday and Friday of Thanksgiving, in two days, we did $195,000 at the gate and sold 23,000 tickets. Point I'm making is all of these individuals, baby faces and heels, their personality was clearly defined. Whether they were good or bad people, the fans knew them and reacted to them, and they all looked differently, and they acted differently, and they spoke differently. And they didn't do anything out of character for who they were. And they had their, the baby faces were always friends with each other and would walk through hell with gasoline britches for each other. And the heels were always on each other's side, especially when they needed the numbers advantage, but they weren't above stabbing each other in the back at the appropriate time to get ahead. And one of the big fucking things that would happen is when someone switched from one side to another. Hence, as I believe I've illustrated over this year, the two big switches were Dr. Death switching from being a featured baby face to a top heel and Mr. Wrestling 2 switching from a top baby face to a top heel for a short run that didn't work out before he finally, over the last couple of weeks he was in the territory put over his henchman who had been decided on was going to be a bigger top heel otherwise everybody stayed in their allotted fucking and and as i recall uh i mentioned in february butch reed and jim neidhart the former tag team champions had just broken up and neidhart was on his way out because butch was winning that feud it was something that happened once or twice a year that someone on the same side would suddenly turn on each other. And that's why that drew. And that made big money. When when two here turned on TA, it made him a star as well. Um, that was the last push toward getting TA over and putting him in singles to becoming the North American champion when he'd been a tag team before. It was a very important tool. We've lost it. You don't just book baby faces indiscriminately to fight baby faces especially on tv because then you're splitting the audience who are you going to cheer for i mean we'll just cheer for both of them well then we don't really care who wins it's not going to be any emotional catharsis we're just watching moves or if you have heels arguing with each other if it happens all the time which it obviously is now well what the fuck well the the only reason that a heel program works is if it's a dream match situation. Uh, the Tully Blanchard, Arn Anderson, and the Midnight Express were in the same company for three and a half years before they fucking were in the same ring with each other. And then it was a dream match, and it drew better than the NWA World Championship series that was going on because people it was new and they hadn't seen it. The two most decorated teams of, of the entire Crockett era in the 80s now we're going to fight each other, but even then, 
Dusty was smart enough to know past the initial shock and attraction, you then have to make one side the sympathetic side. That's why we became the sympathetic side, so the horsemen bec could become full heels. And it wasn't just because, well, they can get more heat than we can. It was because Dusty made a decision that we would actually be better in the sympathetic position. But you have to make these things legitimate and fit the situation. And you can't just have people stabbing each other in the back in every match because it's a multi-man match or a four-way, or they're going to fight this week, and next week they're on the same side, and we can't keep track of this. And nobody works like a heel, and nobody works like a baby face. To, to compound the tragedy of the rotten subpar amateur hour booking. I'm just telling you, they got fucking national television and a billionaire's money, and here's a company owned by a cowboy living in Bixby, Oklahoma, that ran events in four states. And over the course of the year, Oklahoma City ran 24 events, drew 180,000 paid admissions, and grossed $1.2 million. Houston, Texas, if I have my notes here correctly, I believe I do somewhere. God damn it, yes. No. Ah, yes, Houston, Texas, 24 events, 175,000 paid admissions, $1.1 million gross. Tulsa. 1984 money, just to specify. Nine, and, well, yeah, and, and by the way, multiply it two and a half times, because $1,000 then, I just looked up, is like two and two and a half thousand dollars now. So when we're talking about grossing $1,250,000 in a year in Oak City, that's actually should be two and a half, uh, a little over three. Um, Tulsa. 21 events, 100,000 paid, $700,000 gross. And the New Orleans area, there were four Superdomes that sold 75,000 tickets and grossed over 600 grand, and 25 other events at the downtown auditorium or the lakefront arena that sold uh, another almost 100,000 tickets. So the total for the town for the year was 160,000 admissions. $1.2 million gross. In just New Orleans, Houston, Tulsa, and Oak City, and this was a territory that ran literally, as we've talked about, seven fucking nights a week. They grossed uh, 1.2, there's two, there's three, there's four and a half, there's... Oh, God, I missed the last number, four and a half, God damn it. In today's money, $10 million with baby faces and heels and everybody understanding why everybody was mad. Do you see why I'm frustrated? Well, that's one of the big things. As someone who has seen all these Mid-South Wrestling Television episodes from this period of time, you never were confused about what was happening. Even if an angle wasn't finished and everything wasn't spelled out yet, like Dr. Death and Terry Taylor in the TV title. You still had an idea of what was going on week after week. Nothing was dropped. Nothing just disappeared. Nothing was they, ignored they, for they, a few they, weeks. They say now, they say now, well, we want the fans to ask questions. Well, you want them to be asking questions about what's happening, not wondering what's going on. As about, I wonder what he's going to do. Not, I wonder what the fuck he's doing. Right? Right. It, uh, anyway. That is my notes, and that's my uh, suggestions to all the amateur armchair bookers out there, especially the ones that actually have their own fucking wrestling promotions now. Make this much more fucking simple so people can understand it. Not simple so it's boring. Simple so it makes sense. Establish your people and only have them interact with people that it will be a boon to their careers if they interact with, interact with rather than people sitting there going, well, fuck, I don't want him to beat so-and-so because I like so-and-so, and I'm not really sure why they're even fighting. It's just, it's just you're sending monkeys in to do moves is what you're doing. Oh. Hey, uh, if I could ask you, I mean, you just talked about Mid-South. You worked right by Vince McMahon's side for a few years on Creative. How did he... Handle, what did he think about baby faces and heels and how to book them? 
Well, you book baby faces against heels. That's how he thought about it. That's why he had a fucking talent roster like everybody else. It wasn't in <laughs> heels on the fucking right, baby face on the left. It wasn't until the attitude era and the the you know the bad influence that got up Vince's ass. And also it wasn't it wasn't really egregious at that point. I mean, one of the reasons why they never did babyface matches is because Vince Sr. had done Bruno and Pedro after he swore he'd never do it, but they wanted to do it, and he rented Shea Stadium, and it rained, and they they did 2,000 people above a garden house, right? And and they had to go to a draw. They couldn't have a finish because he rightfully – and he and also Bruno wanted to work with Andre and do a stadium show, and he did, but Vince Sr. was not going to beat either one of them. Vince was more open to doing heel versus heel matches because they're easier and there's interest. Um, but Vince Jr., until the Attitude Era and, and they started just opening up everything, he was still traditional in that you have to have the baby face versus the heel. Where he got away from it and where it wasn't really that bad is that when you had that incredible top mix, Austin, Rock, Taker, Foley, Brett for the time that he was there with those other guys. Uh, it, you did have guys that you could cross back and forth because Austin was a classic anti-hero babyface, so he would stab people in the back, and Mankind was convincingly crazy, so he could do whatever. And Undertaker was a goddamn emissary of death, so he doesn't have to be all that polite. And Bret Hart was a baby face in Canada and a heel here in the United States, blah, blah, blah. So that worked because those people never did shit that those individual people wouldn't do, shouldn't do, or wouldn't do if they were who they purported to be. But then at the same time, you couldn't change that forever because you're not going to have those guys forever. And you have to go back to tradition I know as bad as some people hate that word, go back to tradition so that you can reestablish what normal is and get a baseline so that later on when your business needs it, you can go off again into the, because if you just keep doing that, which they did, and just matching up people in a lot of cases for no reason, then it devalues it and then you've fucking lost it. You've, you've lost the people and you've lost the, the tool in your arsenal of being able to do that. And it just becomes, oh, and everybody's going to wrestle everybody. And then, then the guys concentrate more on doing their moves and getting their exciting, you know, dives and flips and rolls and barrel rolls and everything in than figuring out how are they going to not only work the match as either a baby face or a heel, but how are they going to let people know, the viewers at home know, who they should be cheering and booing from the time you see them. All the guys' entrances look the same. Only a few fucking even bother to act like a fucking prick on the way out. And some of the people that are acting like pricks on their entrances are supposed to be the baby faces, but they look like such goddamn ungodly douchebags that you'd rather have the fucking stench of grizzly death on you than fucking cheer for that fucking putz. Everything about you, from the time you walk out in front of the people until the time you go back through the curtain should exude and portray how the fans are to react to you. And if the heel goes out there and does a variety of wow-inducing, crowd-pleasing flips and dives and moves, then he's the baby face. Whether he can do them or not is immaterial. If he's going to be the heel or supposed to be the heel, he shouldn't be fucking doing them. Just because you can cut your own ear off doesn't mean you're Van Gogh. And by the same token, if the babyface comes out, especially if it's not a hot match or his issue is not over or he's not over, and he starts just fucking jumping on the guy and punching and grabbing him by the hair and throwing his head in the turnbuckle, well, fuck, then apparently he's the fucking heel because he didn't even start wrestling by the rules. Subliminal shit. That's why the only reason this shit appeals to Anybody anymore, the, the people it appeals to are, like you said, in the wrestling bubble where they have come, this behavior and this style and what they're doing in the ring is accepted because they know what's going on and so they understand and they know that the business is bullshit anyway and this is all just fucking choreographed fucking gymnastic high school tumbling and they don't 
give any thought to what would make sense to a normal person watching this since they're supposed to be fighting, right? And that's why no normal people watch this shit anymore except for the cult of cornet listeners out there that watch it, as the kids say, ironically, so that we can make fun of their attempts to do this right and failing abysmally. Have I made myself clear?